Thank mm-hmm. you.
Hi everyone, welcome to Cornerstone Online. My name's Finn and I'm so excited that you're here hanging out with us today. If you're on live with us at our Sunday 9am gathering and you'd like someone to pray with you, click on the prayer button at the bottom of the screen and it will take you to a private chat. If you're watching this later on in the week, we would still love to pray with you. Email us at prayer at cornerstonenj.org and a member of our staff will get back to you. We are about to get into this week's message, but before we start, let's take a moment to reflect and prepare our hearts for what God may have in store for us today. Across the page of time, he who made every living thing, behold him. He who heard humanity's cry, left his throne to wake as a child, he became like the least of us.
As I mentioned last week, I want to thank you again for your generosity and for all of you who responded to our best gift offering. The response was really overwhelming and we were able to eliminate all of our shortfall, much more than we thought we were going to do. And so thank you for that. I want to remind you that some of you gave above and beyond. Some of you did a special act of giving in order to meet this need. But the reason that we bring up uh, giving every single week, whether we have a need or not, is because giving is an act of worship. Much like prayer or reading or listening to a sermon, it's an act of worship. And what God wants you to do is to develop the habit of giving regularly in season and out of season. And there are times when we respond to a specific need above and beyond, but one of the habits that you want to learn to cultivate is a regular habit of giving to God's work and those things that move you. So we want to encourage you to do that. Once again, there are two different ways that you can give. There are giving boxes here at the church in the foyer that you can use. There's an envelope and then a seat pocket in front of you. If you're here locally, you can use that, that envelope and you can put it in the giving box. But you can also go to our website, cornerstonenj.org. There's a, there's a tab to, for giving and you can go there and you can set up giving automatically. You can do it uh, that way as well. Either way, it's meant to be an act where we put God first and we do that in a practical way by giving regularly. Thank you for doing that with us. You have to remember that this was a bad time to be alive. It was a scary, violent, arbitrary, godless time to be alive. That's when the story of Ruth took place. We are halfway through the book of Ruth, but in order to really understand it, you have to remember that it took place in a time when the judges judged. That was the term that was used. The judges judged as a time that took place from the death of Joshua, uh, right after the Jews entered the promised land, up until really up until when David became king. It was David who, by the power of his own love for God, really changed the nature of the entire nation and really changed the character. But in between, there were no strong leaders. It was the Wild West. It was just a lawless world. It was the kind of place that if you arrived at a town after sunset, you could not just sleep on a park bench somewhere. You might not live through the night. You had to be locked down inside somebody's house. It was that kind of a place. It was even worse for women. And it seemed that all of the religion, everything happening in the nation, even people who are trying to do things for God, became increasingly laced with paganism and mythology and superstition and all kinds of things. And it got worse and worse. And that's why the activity of the people in the book of Ruth is even more noticeable. Because Ruth and Boaz and even Naomi act with a kind of loving faithfulness that the Jews called hesed. It means loving kindness or loving faithfulness. They act that way and it really stands out because there's nothing in the culture that reinforces that. They are living examples of faithfulness in a culture where nobody else seems to be living uh, concerned with faithfulness and loving kindness. We're going to pick up the story where we left it off last week, but let me give you a recap, okay? Naomi had gone uh, to the nation of Moab with her husband and two young sons. There was a famine in their land, so they went to Moab. Moab was a neighboring country, but it was a completely different culture. They worshiped different gods, and they would be seen as foreigners in that land. While Naomi was there, her husband died. And she was left with her two sons. But her two sons grew and both married women who were from Moab. But while they were married for several years, they didn't produce any children. And both of her sons died. And she was left alone. She heard that the famine was over and decided to go back to Bethlehem in Judah. One of her daughters-in-law returned home to her family, which was completely understandable. And frankly, it was the right thing to do. But one of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, 
said, I will not return to my family. I'm coming with you because I feel a great love for you and a great love for your God. And where you go, I'm going to go. I'm going to stay with you. She had such a loving faithfulness to Naomi that she left her family and her God and all of her culture and went to be with Ruth. That was a great act of loving kindness. And then Boaz showed an act of faithfulness and loving and kindness because Boaz gave Ruth a job. He could have taken advantage of her. He could have paid her below minimum wage. He could have he could have done anything because Ruth had no cards to play with. She was a foreigner. She was a woman. She was alone. But instead, Boaz treated her with dignity, gave her a job. And now Boaz and Ruth have become friends. And Naomi and Ruth are being taken care of because of this regular income. So we pick up the story when Naomi gets an idea. Chapter 3 says this. Ruth chapter 3 verse 1 says, One day Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find you a home where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, whose women you have, uh, you have worked with, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So it seems that Naomi has somehow woken up out of her own grief and, um, and begun to realize, I need to do something for Ruth. Ruth is also a widow, but she's much younger than I am, and she needs a home. She needs to be cared for. And this guy, Boaz, seems to be paying attention to her. He seems to be really nice to her. And he's somebody that our family knows. So I think you should, you know, let Boaz know that you are available. That's basically what she does. As an older woman, she says to Ruth, look, I got to tell you how this is. You got you to gotta cross the line. You got you to, gotta, you know, make a move here. You've got to let this guy know that you are available. You and I wouldn't pick this up when we're just reading Ruth, but what she tells Ruth to do is extremely risky. It's not only risky, it's risque. What's happening is they're threshing all the wheat. Um, they're taking all the wheat and they're pounding it down. They're taking the part that they can eat and they're keeping it over here and they're letting all the chafe go this way. It's long work and there'll be big piles of wheat all wrapped up, okay? Basic farming stuff. They're going to work so hard that... that Boaz is going to stay out on the threshing floor. He's going to sleep there. Now, whether it's to protect it from robbers or whatever, we're not sure, but he's going to sleep there. And she says, she says, go and wait till he's asleep and uncover his feet and lie down at his feet. Now, the threshing floor was known as a licentious place. It was that place where people went for illicit sexuality. That's just how it was known because people weren't at home. They weren't in their house. They slept out under the stars. In fact, some scholars think that prostitutes would go out to the men who were staying there, knowing that they would be alone, and offer themselves, right? So it's in this setting that Naomi says, Ruth, you should go out there. Now, she's not asking Ruth to act like a prostitute, but she is telling Ruth, go and let him know that you're available and see what happens. So Ruth says, okay. And, uh, you know, he shouldn't say just go. He says, you know, bathe, put on perfume, put on your best dress, and then go and uncover his feet. So that's what happens. Verse 7, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovering his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was this woman lying at his feet. Verse 9, who are you? He said, I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he said. This kindness is greater than the one you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor, 
And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do what you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. So she uncovers his feet. You need to realize that when Naomi says this, you know, put on your best things, go there, uncover his feet, whether she knows it or not, the people reading Ruth, everything she says could be taken as a double entendre. It's all embedded in the text. All of these things were euphemisms. So taken wrongly, this could be read very crassly and, and, and very graphically. Now, that's not what Ruth does, but she does lay down at his feet. He wakes him in the middle of the night, probably because his feet were uncovered and they were cold. And he's, he looks down and there's this woman at his feet. Now, again, it's dark. And um, he could be thinking, if he's a man of character, he'd be thinking this prostitute is laying here at my feet. He's going to get me in trouble. He's going to, what's going on? So he says, who are you? And then she says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Now, when she says, put the corner of your garment over me, she's not just saying, hey, give me some of the blanket. I'm cold too. To spread the corner of your garment over somebody was a euphemism for marriage. It's like she said, it's Ruth. And I think you and I should take a walk down the aisle together. That's what she's saying. It would be like she said, I think we should take a walk down the aisle together. Or she could say, I think we need to exchange a couple of rings. What do you think? She's basically proposing marriage. But notice that she's also thrown something in. She says, put your garment over me since you are a garden redeemer of our family. Now, it's unclear whether or not Naomi told her to go and, and make herself available to Boaz because Boaz had this close relationship with Naomi's family, or she was just concerned about Ruth. I think she was mostly concerned about Ruth. But Ruth knows that Boaz might be a guardian redeemer for the family. That means he might have legal obligations to care for, for Ruth as a widow, and maybe to some degree to care for Naomi as a widow. That there might be a legal lineup here, that if they marry, she would then, he would then be, uh, redeem the family that Ruth had been a part of, her dead husband, Melon, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Elimelech, her husband. And so that's exactly how Boaz takes it. He says, I know what you're asking me. You're not asking me just to marry you because you and I think we would be good together. You're asking me to marry you because if I marry you, it also is good for Naomi. It redeems all of her land. It keeps her land in the family. And you can see we still have these kind of legal things in our family, in, in our culture, right? Certain inheritances follow family lines. And there could be, you know, if I marry you, I become a citizen. And then if I become a citizen, I can inherit the land and Naomi can inherit the land. And Naomi will have a grandchild and it will be an heir of, you know, Naomi's family. So there's all that legal stuff going on. And Boaz recognizes it. Now, the good news is he doesn't take advantage of Ruth. He doesn't propose that like, well, if you want me to marry you, what can you give me in return? Maybe we should, you know, check this out. Maybe we should test to see if we're compatible. He could have done anything. Ruth was completely helpless. He could have ruined her reputation. He could have taken advantage of her. He could have promised one thing, taken advantage of her and not delivered. He could have done any of those things, but he doesn't. Naomi's gut instinct is right. Boaz is a man of character and he shows great fellowship. He shows great restraint and character. And he says, I'll do it. He's charmed. In fact, he says, look, you know, he says, um, you could have gone after love, younger men. You could have gone after better looking men. You could have gone after wealthier men. You could have done anything for yourself, but you are marrying me not just because of me, but for your mother-in-law. And that's good news. What he's saying is that's good news for me because you can tell he wants to marry Ruth. But then he says in verse 12, Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning. If he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, great, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lay here until morning. So she lay there at his feet until morning, but got up um, before anyone could be recognized and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Remember, this was scandalous activity. 
Verse 15, he said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed a bundle on her. Then she went back to town. So Boaz is saying, look, if you want me to marry you as a guardian redeemer, as one who would redeem not just you, but Ruth, that Naomi as well, I'd be glad to do it. I would love to marry you. Um, he's charmed. He's overwhelmed. This is the good part of the Hallmark Hall of Fame uh, Christmas classic movie, right? The couple's getting together. They're going to get married. But every good rom-com has a twist where the two people who are supposed to come together can't come together. It's only 45 minutes through the movie and they get into a fight or something happens. And that's what happens here, except Boaz, except this is not a fictional story. And Boaz says, there's another person who is closer. And if you are really set, on doing a marriage that will take care of Naomi, he has to have first dibs. And, if, and, and I will talk to him. And if he will marry you, good. Uh, you'll be taken care of. Naomi will be taken care of. If he doesn't, I'll do it. And then you'll be taken care of. And Naomi will be taken care of. And I get a wife. And so you say to yourself like, wow, wow. You know, Naomi agrees to this because she's not marrying just for herself. She is doing something that she wants to make sure will care for Naomi. And Boaz is not thinking just of himself. Boaz at this point could have said, hey, look, we got to figure a way around this. We got to hide this. We got to change this. I'm going to lie. I'm going to do this. No, Boaz says, we have to do this the right way. We have to go and make sure that this person has the right to redeem the family. And if he does, I'm going to let him do it because you're going to, because that's going to be best for Naomi. And I know that's where your heart is. I'll be sad, but it'll be the right thing. So you realize at this point that the faithfulness, the hesed that Ruth and Boaz are showing is not just that they're nice people and that they treat people fairly. Something else is going on here. Boaz is showing that he will be obedient to God, even if it makes his life more difficult. Ruth shows that she will be obedient to God, and she will be faithful to her mother-in-law, even if it causes her more risk. Now she has just promised herself to a man that she doesn't even know, but she will do it because it's best for Naomi. I have to tell you, when you talk about this kind of obedience, it's not just obedience because these people are nice people, right? It's, it's a deeper thing than that. You can only obey God to this point if you love God more than anything. And the only way you can love God more than anything is if you experience God's love yourself. Remember last week when we said, the extraordinary love that Boaz shows, the extraordinary love that Ruth shows, is an example, a foreshadow of the love that Jesus will show to us. Jesus is the one who has left his nation his place in heaven and come here and given his life for us. He didn't just say, I will leave my family. He gave his life for us. God said, this is how much I love you. He died in our place so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could have a safe vineyard to live in for the rest of our lives in relationship with our Father. When we internalize this, our love for God will grow, and that love is the only proper motivation for obedience. If we don't, if our obedience doesn't come from that, it's going to run, it's, it's going to run out. We're going to be nice people because we think it's the best way to get the life we want, right? We're going to be nice to other people because we think that that's what's going to get what we want. And then when we have something like a night on the threshing floor with somebody who we're in love with and no one's around, we're going to cross that line. We're going to do the wrong thing because we're in this for ourselves. We're not in this to obey God. We're in this for ourselves. We're just being nice because it's a way of manipulating people and getting to do what we want. And so our goodness will run short. We won't have that powerful loving kindness. In the other way, some people can say, well, I'm going to obey God no matter what, but they're obeying God not because they love God, but because they're bribing God. They think if I do everything right, he will give me the life that I want. You know, so there's that temptation to say, well, I'm going to make sure I follow all these guidelines because there's no way God would ever bring sorrow or disappointment or anything like that into my life um, if I do everything right. And that's what Naomi was dealing with last week. 
when she said, I did everything right. I left, I stayed with my husband, I stayed with my daughters, and everything went terrible. My husband died, my children died, and now I'm left alone. And she can't understand. She can't find God because there's this temptation to think if I do everything right, then my life will be smooth. The, the motivation that really changes us is when we, when we obey God out of love for God. And I really think that we'll only love God to that degree when we understand the good news of Jesus. When we realize, I was lost. I, I had nowhere to turn, and Jesus came and walked alongside of me, and he gave his life so that I could become part of God's family and work in God's vineyard forever. And out of that love, because God has generously loved me, I will generously love others, no matter where it leads, because that's the love I kind of want to reflect. So Ruth goes home with these six measures of barley. Her mother-in-law says, how'd it go? And he says, I got six measures of barley. And she says, whoa, <laughs> that's a good sign. Uh, I got a feeling he's going to make sure that this happens. So next day, Boaz, he goes in chapter four, Boaz goes to the town gate and he gathers together some of the men. He has a legal proceeding to see to here, right? It's, 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 not, a, it's not a law court here. There is an inheritance right, and he needs witnesses to it. It's like, it's like going through a last will and testament or an annuity or something like that. And, and, and it's almost as if, uh, imagine that, um, uh, that somebody dies and there is property to inherit. And the cousin says, hey, you are the inheritor now of this two-family home. You can buy it um, from the rest of the family at this low price, and you become the owner of the two-family home. If you don't want it, I will buy it, right? And uh, But he says, but you need to know that if you buy the home, there's a person who lives there who has a lifetime um, lease, and you can't change her rent, and she you can't kick her out. And at that point, the son might say, well, maybe I want to buy the house, but maybe that's not worth my money anymore to buy the house if you have this lifetime resident. It's a complication, Right. That's what's going on, except it's about buying all of um, Elimelech's property because he's deceased, and Ruth comes with a deal. Here's what happens. Chapter two, or chapter four, verse two. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. He's saying this to the other guy who's the other relative. I thought... I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so that I know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. So he says, I will redeem it. Only after he says that in verse 5, and Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also require Ruth the Moabite the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it for yourself if um, I cannot do it. In other words, he says, okay, there's this land to buy. I'll buy it. Great. I get all this land. That's great. He says, by the way, when you buy the land, you get Ruth. And when Ruth has a child, her child inherits all this land. So he says, wait a second, I'm going to use all of my savings to buy this land, but then Ruth's child is going to inherit it. My children aren't going to inherit it. That's going to split my inheritance. And it's going to use up all my money. It doesn't make any sense. It's not a good investment for anymore. So Boaz says, okay, if you're okay with it, then I'm going to buy it. And so, um, so the, the guardian redeemer in verse 8 says, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal, that to show that it was a promise. Verse 9, then Boaz announced to all the elders and all the people, today... You are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malon. I have also required Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are my witnesses. Everybody cheers because Boaz is going to get married. Nobody ever thought Boaz would get married. He's kind of old. He was a nice guy, but no one is ever around. This woman comes sweeping in. She's from the out place. He's going to redeem the family, and he's going to have a wife. And Ruth is going to get married, and Naomi's going to be taking care of it. Everybody cheers, you know. And uh, 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 
so Boaz and Ruth get married and they have a child. And the child becomes technically an heir of, of Naomi, a grandson of Naomi, as well as a son of Boaz. Now, here's the thing. All these people bring great joy and blessing into each other's lives because they love each other extraordinarily. They show great faithfulness. They don't take their cues from the selfish, violent, uh, arbitrary culture around them. As the culture deteriorates, they are determined that their actions are going to be led by reflecting God's loving kindness toward them. God has been loving to me, and I am going to be lovingly obedient to other people as a way of honoring my God. I'm going to obey God, even though nobody else may care about doing the right thing by Ruth. I can make these decisions. I can be obedient. Even if nobody else understands, I can live this way. And because of that, they bring great blessing into each other's lives. But they do more than that. Because they are doing this out of a motivation to honor God, they open their lives up for God to use them. And they become part of the larger story. Not just them living their best life now, but them living the story of God as they live their lives because they are living it in allegiance and obedience to God. And so here's what happens. They say, bless you, this is going to be great. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he had made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. And the women said to Naomi, praise be the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for you, daughter-in-law, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. The birth of a new child brings hope to everybody, even to a widow. It brings renewal. It reminds you that God is still at work. And then in verse 16, then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And you say, whoa, whoa, wait, what happened? And then the the story of Ruth ends with a genealogy saying, this is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon was the father of Salmon, Salmon was the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, who was born to Ruth. Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. So Ruth becomes the great-grandmother of David, the king who who saves the nation, who changes the course of history, and who becomes the direct antecedent, the, the, the direct line of Jesus himself. Ruth becomes a direct descendant of Jesus himself. And it's a picture of what God wants to do through you and I. He wants us to love one another with that kind of awesome faithfulness because of our love for him, not only because it's the best way to love other people, but because we enter into his story. And when we obey him, when we put him first, we allow him to work in our lives to affect not just our immediate family, but to be a part of what God is doing in the world. So Ruth, this woman who just simply wanted to love well the people around her, God uses her loving faithfulness to bring about the great King David and through her, Jesus himself. That's what God wants to do through you. He wants to use your life, not just to bless the people around you, but to make an impact on the entire world, and he will do it. He will do it if we make the simple, immediate decisions before us to live faithfully and lovingly and obediently to the God who saved us. If we do that, we become part of the story that God is telling in the larger culture, and he will use us. Let's pray. Father, Help us to make the decisions today out of obedience, out of love for you and love for the people around us. Show us what your will is for the situations that we face and use our lives to make a bigger impact on the world than we could ever imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I just want to quickly remind you about some things happening here at Cornerstone. Our men's ministry is hosting another gathering in a series of events called The Well on July 12th. If you're looking to connect and get to know some other men from Cornerstone, this is a great place to do that. Sign up for this gathering today at cornerstonenj.org forward slash events. 
For our middle and high schoolers, Cornerstone Youth is hosting summer parties throughout July and August, so take note of these dates. It will be a great time to hang out with your friends, play some games, and learn about deepening your relationship with Jesus. If you have any questions about these parties, you can contact our youth director, Katie Becker. This Wednesday is the first meeting of Pastor Fred Provincher's Bible study. This is a six-week study of our core passions and discovering where they come from. If you want to join this group, sign up at cornerstonenj.org forward slash events. This class will meet in the upper barn at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesdays throughout July and August. Now, let's talk about a pretty big change coming up in the way that we do church online. Since the onset of the pandemic, all of our online content has been pre-recorded and released on Sunday mornings. And for the past year, we've been using this platform called the Church Online Platform to stream our pre-recorded Sunday gatherings. But we're going to change all of that up. Starting in August, we will be recording the actual in-person Sunday sermon. We'll make that available to you by noon on Sundays. There are a couple of reasons that we're doing this, but the most important one is this. We want people to be able to see what it's really like here at Cornerstone. We want them to get a better glimpse into our community and what our pastors are like. So we will no longer be using the church online platform and the release of the sermons will be moving back just a little bit. You'll be able to find every sermon on our website at noon every Sunday. Just click the watch button at the top of the page. Or you can also find it on our Vimeo page. All right, that's all I have for today. To get more information about events like these, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Or you can sign up for our weekly email by going to our website and clicking on a subscribe button at the bottom of the page. Thanks again for hanging out with us and have a great rest of your day.